Hold on. Please bow your heads. Today we ask for new strength so we can build places of belonging to create a community for everyone to share their gifts. Help us to know that each of us is loved and enable us to see the light in all we strive to accomplish. Grant us the wisdom to see events in their true spirit that we may learn in thought and understanding for the gain of all. We know many who are struggling and have been challenged with life's many hurdles. Help us to forge bonds of compassion, dignity, and respect with every person and be problem solvers in our capacity. Let us be reminded that we come from different places, hold different values, and cherish different beliefs. Yet today, may we be united in gratitude, and may that gratitude grow into peace for each with the freedom to live, work, and serve, not just today, but throughout all our days. Amen. Uh oh, hold on. oh, you can hear me now. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, All right, if you join me with the pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, would you please call roll? Councilwoman Fuga? Here. Councilwoman McKenzie? Here. Councilwoman Parker? Councilwoman Ryder? Here. Vice Mayor Alberto? Here. Councilwoman Singh. Here. Councilman Smith. Here. Councilwoman Testerman. Here. And Councilman Thomas. Here. Eight members present, Mayor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> moving on to item four. Is there a motion on the minutes from our last meeting? Move to approve. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Are there any items to be withdrawn? Are there any items to be postponed? Are there any items requested to be added by motion? Is there a motion on the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now time for my mayor's report. Before, before I get into my mayor's report, you all have noticed that we do have new microphones. Um, I would ask that at least uh, for the foreseeable future that you continue to use your lights and you, have the, you can turn your microphones on and off as you've already figured out. So um, they're supposed to be a little more sensitive too, so you don't necessarily have to get quite as close. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to start out... Uh, my mayor's report this evening to say that I know I am with that you share my sadness, uh, my heartbrokenness over the tragic death of Knox County Sheriff's Deputy Tucker Blakely. Deputy Blakely was shot while responding to a domestic violence incident Sunday night, and he died last night at UT Medical Center. On behalf of the city of Knoxville, we send our condolences to the friends and family of Deputy Blakely and to the entire KCSO family. I wanna thank uh, Chief Noel and the Knoxville Police Department for working with KCSO to help cover their calls while the deputies and their families had a chance to visit the hospital. Uh, and also wanna thank the fire and police department and so many residents of our community for lining the 275 corridor as he was taken from the medical examiner's office to the funeral home in Powell. It's a reminder that our first responders put their lives on the line every day. And this incident is a stark reminder of the sacrifices that they and their families make when they take the oath to protect and serve. If you would please join me in a moment of silence to honor and remember Deputy Blakely. Thank you. And now I would like to take a moment to invite Catherine Ellis, the Executive Director of the Family Justice Center, up to the podium to speak to council and members of the community who are watching about this month uh, and what it means for our domestic violence awareness in our community. So Ms. Ellis, if you would uh, turn the mic on and uh, please take up to two minutes to share with us about 
your work. All right, thank you, Mayor Kincannon, council members. Um, as she said, I'm Catherine Ellis. I'm the executive director of the Knoxville Family Justice Center. A few of you know me, know I don't follow scripts, but I'm trying today so that I can stay on time. Um, the FJC, for those of you who don't know, we serve as the hub for domestic violence victims and stalking victims in Knoxville and Knox County. We have eight on-site partners, Knoxville Police Department, Knox County Sheriff's Office, McNabb Center, Sexual Assault Center of East Tennessee, the YWCA Legal Aid of East Tennessee, the Knox County District Attorney's Office, and DCS. Yesterday, we had planned an event to kick off Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We were going to have Mayors Kincannon and Jacobs reading proclamations. We were going to be recognizing a KPD officer and a KCSO officer who were selected by their own colleagues as having gone above and beyond for victims of domestic violence in our community. The news of Deputy Blakely being shot Sunday evening while responding to a domestic violence call made it obvious that we were going to cancel that event. Um, and domestic violence is something that those of us who work at the Family Justice Center deal with day in and day out every day. We deal with victims who come in sometimes with visible bruises, sometimes it's been emotional and mental abuse, and the numbers that we are seeing has been increasing every year. In the past 12 months, we have had members of our community walk through our doors seeking assistance 2,538 times. That is compared to 1,938 the previous 12 months. So far this year alone, we have had 318 children come in with their parents while their parents are seeking help. This is something that the staff of the Family Justice Center and all of our partner agencies are dedicated to working with these victims, dedicated to helping them. But it's also something that we know, and now yesterday, just drove it home a little bit more, is something that is dangerous for every single person who's working in this field. Um, the first responders obviously are on the front line, but we also have to try to make it safe for those of us who work with victims at the Family Justice Center and everywhere else in the city. Thank you very much. And I know that the Family Justice Center has a website for people who want to find out more information or support your work. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, uh, I also would like now to thank you for your workshop that you held last week on the missing middle proposal. Uh, really good discussion. I was glad to uh, you know, hear your thoughts and uh, appreciate your willingness to dig deeper into ways we can all work to bring an end to our housing crisis. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of that workshop, and as you all very well know, the middle housing proposal is just one small piece of a bigger puzzle, but it will help clear the way to bring back what was once a common form of housing to our city. And again, a reminder that the middle housing proposal can be found online at knoxvilletn.gov, missing middle. Another part of the puzzle that you all have been supporting uh, over the last few years is to address homelessness. And I wanted to uh, announce to you all, I think I, I sent it in an email, but I wanted to announce here during my mayor's report that we just received a $1.8 million grant to help prevent and end youth homelessness in Knoxville. Uh, youth homeless have experiences that are distinct and have, need special services and supports in a way that adults experiencing homelessness may not. So this is a federal, a, federal, a federal renewable grant, and our Youth Action Board will help inform the best ways this funding can be put to use. So the Knoxville, Knox County Con, um, Community Agency, CAC, Community Agency, what's the second? Community Action Committee so, um, received the grant with the help of Sean Griffith, who managed the application process. So I want to thank Sean, who is part of the Office of Housing, uh, Joint Office on Housing Stability, and everyone who worked so hard on this. And I just want to especially thank the members of the Youth Action Board, uh, because it was their um, direct contributions to the grant application. We've applied to this grant many years in a row, and we kept getting closer but it was their direct participation and, and contributions to how the grant would help them 
and uh, deal with their housing instability and their, their peers who are coming into it now, getting out of foster care or whatnot. Um, and, and that was what I think was the winning ingredient to winning the grant this year. So thank you to the members of our Youth Action Board. <clears throat> Tonight is National Night Out, and neighborhoods all across Knoxville are holding events to bring residents and our first responders together. Uh, Chief Noel is taking part in those activities right now, uh, which is why he's not here this evening. Um, and there's also many police officers and firefighters uh, from all over the city attending these events in neighborhoods um, all across the city. So I want to thank the neighborhoods for hosting these events. Um, and say that um, in the future we'll plan to um, depart from the national date and put it on a, a date where members of council and I can attend too because um, it's important that we be there with the neighbors to um, celebrate this night and, and support our first responders. So going forward, it will not coincide with the city council night. Quick reminder about our rules of decorum. Those who wish to speak, either to a specific agenda item or during public forum, should sign up with Mr. Johnson, our city recorder, ahead of time. Um, please do not use profanity. And when speaking to specific agenda items, please remember to stay on topic. Those who fail to adhere to these rules may be ruled out of order and asked to step away from the podium. For those who are listening, please note that you may not disrupt a public meeting from the audience. Those who do may be asked to leave. Thank you in advance for everyone's respect for these rules. That concludes my mayor's report. Are there any reports of council members? Vice Mayor Roberta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to take a moment and congratulate uh, Councilmember Parker, who will be recognized by the National Homeless Law Center next week. I also want to congratulate Councilmember Ryder, who was selected to participate in the flagship program of the Leadership Knoxville class of 2024. I know you all probably think you're the best class ever, but I think 2023 has something to say about that still. Uh, and I think actually most of us have been through it. And I see a lot of shaking heads because I think there's a lot of best classes ever that are up here. But anyway, I just wanted to say congratulations. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member McKenzie, or was Council Member Singh first? Uh, whoever, yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just thank you, Catherine Ellis, for speaking today. This is the, the field that I work in as well in a different uh, type of capacity than Catherine does. I work with the people who uh, are offenders and oftentimes are victims as well and families who are not ready to seek help and are choosing to stay together and trying to do harm reduction and keep them safe. Two weeks ago, all this housing issue really getting emotional and um, I, I also got very emotionally dysregulated and I apologize for that. Um, but the issue was a lot of these people are staying in these relationships that it's not just a tugging of the hair. I mean, it's some pretty scary situations because they have nowhere else to go, because there's no housing. So the way when I come into council meeting after talking to people who are stuck without any options, it just kind of all, it's all related, it's all connected, and I want solutions now. And I know we are a big ship, and it's slow to move, but I'm glad we're moving forward. Thank you, Council Member McKenzie. Thank you, Mayor, and I also wanna thank uh, Council Member Singh uh, for her comments, uh, and also Ms. Ellis for the work that you all do, and just wanna encourage anyone uh, who's watching the meeting or who's in the audience, if you or you know someone who is in an abusive relationship or situation, there is help available, there are hotlines, you can go to the website there, uh, but if you're aware, do what you can to offer assistance, even if that's a couch or something for the evening. Uh, but those are very volatile situations. Uh, as we saw, you know, the instance where we, we lost an officer during a domestic violence situation. And so just want to encourage everyone to please uh, be mindful. And if you know someone, and sometimes maybe you're the one that might need to make that call to help someone. Uh, also, uh, on a more pleasant note, just want to remind everyone that Knoxville College is having their annual homecoming this weekend. It kicks off on Thursday at 6 o'clock with an opening celebration. Uh, there's a meet and greet. Their slogan is, Let There Be Light. Uh, also, on Friday at 9 a.m., it starts with some exercise, uh, and they have the gala on Friday the 6th uh, at 7 p.m., Saturday, starting at 10 o'clock, there's festival on the yard, there's memorial services, there are performers, 
uh, just a lot of fun, food, and good time. And at 6 o'clock, there's a comedy show. That's free. And Sunday, uh, the 8th, there is an Early Risers Farewell Church service. Dr. Renee Kester will be preaching. And at 2 o'clock, Brian Clay, who we all uh, are familiar with, will be performing. And then at 3 p.m., there's a jazz, uh, a gospel explosion. So just encourage everyone to please support Knoxville College in any way that you can and go to their website. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, seeing no other lights on, we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Mr. Johnson. 8A is resolution confirming the appointments of Dr. Melissa Hinton, Brian O'Connor, and Charlotte Rodina to the Knoxville Tree Board. Move to approve. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 8B is a resolution confirming the appointment of Brad Salisbury, to serve as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Move to approve. Second. Motion made to approve and second it. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 9A is an ordinance to amend the Knox City Code Chapter 2, Article 10, to ensure the continued compliance of the Police Advisory and Review Committee with recent revisions to state law. Motion made to approve and seconded. Uh, council members, there's one person signed up to speak on this item, Ms. Every. You'll have up to five minutes. Okay, cool. Constance, Knoxville, 37914. Uh, yeah, as I've already expressed in the previous city council meeting, uh, this amendment is obviously directly coming from our state legislator, and it just shows how they play the long game. As I said before, America was never happy about police oversights from the public position particularly, uh, and we know that they have been strategically choosing and placing administrators over the years to gut this particular policy. As I highlighted before, Elaine Davis, one of our very own from Knoxville, is the leader of this particular initiative on the state legislator. Uh, and again, ironically, uh, as we sit here and send our condolences to the families of the police officers. We don't want to have anyone killed uh, ever in our community, no matter what the situation or circumstances is. But I am going to express the frustration of how all the heartfelt condolences have been outpoured. But I didn't see any of that when Lisa Edwards was killed. No one sent those heartfelt condolences to her family. We had brought Anthony Thompson Jr.'s whole family in here. Never heard those condolences outpoured from a few. I'll say a few you did. But the majority that I just watched and witnessed here sure didn't do that for them. Robert Bailey, I mean, I, like I said, I can run the names down the list. So it's just ironic how you have this compassion when it's a cop, but when it's your own community constituents, taxpayers, and those individuals, we don't have that same mercy or concern. And that's the irony of what Park was really created for, and yet to date, when you look at it behind Andre Stinson murder and Scott Kofi, who's still employed by the police department today, uh, is one of those reasons why we even had Park created, and you don't see Park stepping up in that particular manner or that area to even bring the, the force of compassion from the so-called administration that we just watched pour it out for the cop, it still shows the concerns and it still shows the tone deafness and it still shows how you all are still pro-police and only can show that concern when it's a cop, but when it's one of your members of your community, we still don't see that reciprocation in return. Uh, and so therefore, as far as expressing the frustration of it all, I am excited to announce that Justin Jones did file a lawsuit against Cameron Sexton, so hopefully we can get some pushback on that particular initiative. We can also shout out uh, the the federal government on putting McCarthy out of there too. Shout out to those folks who made that initiative happen. Maybe you all can take a clue and see how other legislative bodies are moving to see that we have to start moving towards the particular thing that we need, which is accountability. Uh, you know, it's ironic that KPD is quote unquote getting this credit for back in the Knox County Sheriff Department, but on the same night the cop was shot, they was running around the city harassing homeless people that were sleeping in their cars. So my question is KPD, was you supporting the Knox County Sheriff Department or was you harassing the homeless people in our communities. I'm still trying to figure it out what is Knoxville's vision because we have not yet seen one and more importantly I don't understand how India got reelected by 9,000 voters who cannot explain the justifications of their vote in the first place. So with all that being said the long story short comes down to is that part never really served its uh, pr purpose in the first place, but the reality is that voters pay attention to how they played the long game and understand something. This was something that when they put the thing together in 96, 97, they were playing on this in the years coming to gut this initiative. And it's the irony, ir irony how voters, you put the right people in office so that they could do it. I yield my time. Council, that concludes uh, public forum on this. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
there looked to be a, a typo in the um, resolution um, or in the ordinance, I'm sorry. And so I'm gonna make a motion to amend the ordinance by striking out the word executive directory where that was supposed to say executive director. And so wherever we see executive directory, I'm gonna make a motion that we change that to executive director. Okay, motion made to amend uh, to fix that typo from directory to director. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of this amendment, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion to amend carries. Now we're back to the original motion as amended. Are there any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I'm going to abstain from this vote. Any opposed? Motion carries uh, seven pro ayes and two abstentions. Eleven A is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement with CDM Smith Incorporated to provide professional engineering design services for the old city streetscapes project phase two for an amount not to exceed one million one hundred thirty-seven thousand eight hundred twenty dollars. Move to approve. Motion made to approve and seconded. Uh, there's one person signed up to speak uh, against this, uh, Miss Every. Yes, uh, so the streetscape project is a concern because we still have not addressed the Magnolia streetscape, nor have we addressed the Burlington streetscape. Uh, we know that in India's previous administration, she actually moved money from those particular streetscapes to do other projects, particularly facing on the South Knoxville Riverfront area. Uh, and it's just ironic how the question has remained to date, what is the plan for the Magnolia and the Burlington streetscape? Uh, and to once again see new business jump in front of old business on our agenda and funding in particularly, uh, it comes back to the concerns that we've been expressing when it comes to the black neighborhoods, especially uh, how you all have continued to fail to fund us appropriately and address our concerns of the disenfranchisement over the years of the Knoxville administrations uh, previous and currently have to just continue to ignore our needs. Uh, when are we going to put money towards the Magnolia streetscape? We know that there were several black, black business contractors on those projects who were put on pause and even removed at this point. Uh, and the key thing is that some of these business have been impacted so heavily not just because of the lack of funding and contracting but we had COVID as well hit these businesses and some of these businesses have unfortunately had to remodel themselves or even completely shut down and so once again we are trying to understand why was the priority given to uh Broadway's area, Old City's area particularly, over the East Knoxville area that was in front of this initiative before it ever came down. I can, I, can, I can probably guess, since it's in the Old City, I want to give a good shot that it has something to do with that baseball stadium, Randy Boyd, but we're not going to say that tonight. It's more about how you all have been continuing to misappropriate and defund our communities, but then at the same time want to pass resolutions for $100 million of harm, and we ain't even seen a dime on that money yet either today. So, again, Knoxville, when are you going to give black communities the funding we need, when are you going to come in on your promises that you made to our neighborhoods, and more importantly, what is the vision of the Magnolia and Burlington streetscape projects that were in front of the old city project? I yield my time. That concludes people signing up to speak to this. Council Member Parker. Can we get an update on um, the other streetscapes projects that we have that are underway? I'd be happy to share that with council members by email later this week. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of streetscape projects going on. I'm not prepared to give the update uh, right now. Could we, uh, we know that um, Burlington has, uh, that funding has been identified mm -hmm. for the Burlington streetscapes to yes, move forward. Yes, in this year's budget. Uh, Mr. Claybo, do you, you have a, give a high level overview of the other projects? In sure. addition to fielding questions about tonight's agenda item. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Tom Plabo, Engineering Director. Uh, Burlington is now in the right-of-way phase, so we're acquiring properties. Uh, so once we get through that, we'll be letting that. Um, it'll probably be the first of the next year when that's led to construction. Uh, Magnolia, the, that project is funded with federal funds, and so we've finished phase one and two of, of Magnolia. We're working on phase three right now, and it's in the right-of-way phase as well. Uh, phase four and five takes that project up to Cherry Street. Okay. I appreciate that. And 
Uh, there are other streetscapes projects, or are those the two main ones? Those are only ones I can think of. Severe. Well, Severe, the ongoing Severe streetscapes project. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, because this is an issue that I have been following, and uh, I think it's important that we continue um, forward with especially the, um, the uh, utility upgrades that come with the streetscapes projects that helps with business development down our corridors. And so I'm just as interested as the public in seeing those move forward. There are some landscaping issues that I do not uh, am not in line with, but that's another issue. But there's some critical infrastructure um, investments that are needed along those corridors. So I think it's really good to keep the public informed um, of where we are with those projects. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Thomas. Uh, yes, just briefly. I also kind of had my eye on Burlington for quite a few years. I go way back to when Burlington actually had some more active businesses and the amount of potential in that area is, is uh, really good. You know, the infrastructure in some ways is there. The building stock is, is um, underutilized to say the least, but it's there. So I think there's a lot of potential there and I look forward to seeing anything going forward in that area uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Council Member McKenzie. Thank you, Mayor. I forgot to hit the light, just the button. And I just want to add that I think that the, uh, the community will be very pleased with, with the progress that we're going to see once we're able to get to that starting phase in January. So there's a lot of additional things that will be coming down the pike as it relates to Burlington. One of the things that, you know, I'm like you, uh, Council Member Thomas, uh, Burlington has so much potential, but we do have some blighted properties there in that area. And that was a conversation I had with... Uh, Deputy Chief Brace earlier this week. And so uh, we'll be looking at, I think it is overdue as far as seeing some movement there. There's been a lot of discussion and I think that folks will be very pleased. And so let's continue to ask those questions and stay on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11B is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement with Roadway Solutions LLC for the 2023 citywide guardrail replacement program for an annual amount not to exceed $300,000. Move to approve. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11C is a resolution authorizing the mayor to amend the contract with Barge Design Solutions Incorporated for the First Creek Greenway Broadway Streetscape Project, increasing the contract amount by $124,500 for a new contract total of $505,500 and extending the date of completion to May 1, 2025. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 11C. Ms. Every is signed up to speak. Okay, so thank you all for acknowledging the Magnolia and Burlington project, but there's some more projects I want to talk about in East Knoxville that seem to be taking a back burner to this project. My next question is the Chihaui Park project. What is the solution on that? Uh, we know it floods like the Nile River when it rains, and you can take your speedboat out there and jet across the water if you want to. Uh, but then also, what's going on with the uh, hotel project over here? You know, they dumped all the furniture out, uh, made it seem like they were going to bring condominiums in overnight, uh, and yet that has paused. Same thing. What's up with the SunTrust building? What was going on with that? There was supposed to be some promises made about the future of those buildings being used. And let's not forget, the old police station is supposed to be being turned over to the Claytons, and supposed to be a science museum that's coming in, but we have not heard an update to that today. So I'm going to continue to push. I see this money rolling out, but it's not coming to projects that were before it. And more importantly, no updates on what those what is happening with some of these projects that I just brought to the table once again. Now, India, for the record, if you don't know or not pre prepared to share publicly, then maybe you don't say anything and let these council members ask the people like this guy over here the appropriate questions so we can get some answers. Because I'm asking you publicly and saying I'm giving an email out is not the answer to my question. So I'm going to 
yield my time at this point, but I want to highlight that, that there are other projects, again, that was promised first to East Knoxville, and we're not seeing the funding come down or update on those projects, but I'm watching you all give money immediately towards other areas of the city that we know at the end of the day has had multiple divestments. Broadway is well invested in. The issue with Broadway is that street, the way that those streets are set up. Yes, I agree. We need to figure that traffic jam out. But in reality, where does the funding need to come to? Where the blighted properties and the divestment has happened, where the black business and the black district business district doesn't exist anymore, is East Knoxville. So I'm going to continue to push on when are you all going to invest in our communities and into our neighborhoods and put some of these issues on the back burner because you already have promised us up front our funding and our needs first. I yield my time. Mr. Roach has also signed up to speak on item 11C in opposition. Mr. Roach. Rick Roach, Knoxville. Um, once again, we have a situation where promises have been made for at least a couple of decades that I'm aware of. Um, and I'm going to speak off of what Ms. Every was saying earlier. Um, you know, promises made and promises unfulfilled. I won't say broken yet. Um, we've had all these plans. Um, I mean, the Broadway situation definitely has to be taken care of. Streetscape it, make it a boulevard, whatever, like you did Cumberland, whatever. Okay? But we have one particular geographical area in Knoxville that is still waiting. And that is East Knoxville. Literally from the, I guess, Harriet Tubman going east, MLK, Magnolia Corridor. We're waiting. People are waiting. Okay? They're Every, South Knoxville's been squared away. They're doing their thing. West Knoxville's always had it going on. Uh, North Knoxville, Central, Broadway. East Knoxville had plans. They, there were, there've been plans. There've been plans. What do we see? And the one word that goes through all of this because it was 20, 25 years ago, we were hearing the same thing. The one word that came out all the time was what? Potential. Got so much potential. <laughs> Plans were laid. People were asked within the community, what do you want to see happen? We got potential for not our money, but federal dollars coming through. What do you, what do you want to see happen? Instead, we saw, at the time, a semi-thriving, Councilman Thomas, a semi-thriving Burlington, little business district, and you know, it died. In that process, it died. Money was, I don't know what happened to the money. I don't know, maybe somebody can do some serious research or something, I don't know, okay? But it's a systemic choking out of particular communities. Those communities are populated primarily by people that look like me, or at least have my skin tone, or darker, a little bit lighter sometimes. And also people who, like everybody else in Knoxville, trying to make a living, trying to do their thing, been law-abiding, citizens, all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, we're left hanging. People have been left hanging over and over again. And what's happened, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this so you all understand it clearly coming from my point of view, the key element is the people, okay? Because what's happened is you kind of spread out the indigenous black population of East Knoxville. We've moved a little bit connecting Mechanicsville, Lonsdale, the other indigenous black population center. Okay, you spread us out and we're moving north a little bit. 
moved south a little bit because people knew that's where you can get services. That's where you can have a grocery store. That's where you can have everything else. The basic services that define the community. Okay? Hmm. Figure that one out. So now you want to, when we've got serious gentrification going on, now you want to talk about, yeah, let's get this show on the road? Mm-mm. I'm telling Knoxville, don't be fools. Knoxville, don't be fooled. Okay? Because it's the same thing. It's going to, people, there are going to be people losing. And I don't know how long they can put up with it. I really don't know how long they can put up with it. Council members, that concludes people who signed up to speak on this item. Council member Ryder. Yeah. Mr. Claybo, um, quick question. Why is the word streetscapes used in this agenda item? Because this is about the Broadway um, Greenway connection from Fulton High School um, in both directions towards Edgewood, the library, and the thing, the First Creek Greenway. So I feel like it's a little misleading and confusing. That, that's correct. The, and the project name came out of, we ended up getting a, a federal grant for this. Okay. And so in that process, it was titled Broadway Streetscapes, and that's, that carried forward. So, but it is, it's adjacent to Broadway. I know we had a lot of discussion about trying to, to, to move it away from the street, but, but uh, it, it's really adjacent to the street there. It better have a buffer strip still between. It, it does. Okay, cool, cool. I was like, we're about to brawl about that. Okay. Um, okay. I just want, for the record, everybody to know that this is not a streetscapes project. This is a greenways project. That's, that's, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, and I know this is something that Councilman Thomas has long been involved in, the greenway there that we're trying to get connected. Um, I think the Fulton part. doesn't have his greenway. I'm sorry, was that you, Mr. Clavo? No, thank you. The Greenway there took over 20 to 25 years to get completed there along the Fulton, and I'm not sure what some of the holdups there were, and this is to continue making that connection so that we have a Greenway that actually connects and gets uh, people in the city down places towards downtown and connects um, some of Councilman Thomas's and my district, Fountain City, all the way down to downtown. So appreciate that we're... Slowly moving forward on this, um, I know I've been talking about it since I've been on council since 2017, and I know Councilman Thomas was on the Greenways Commission, and so it goes way, way, way back. Thank you. I was just uh, any other questions or comments? Councilmember Testerman. Thank you. Just a quick question, just kind of along those lines, of just noticing, I mean, it seems like, um, I don't want to say a small investment, but for infrastructure, but the completion date is not for another year and a half. I was just curious um, sort of what the project timeline, that just seemed like a long time to me and maybe it's not. Right, and so this is an amendment to the design contract. So that we wanna carry that through the construction process, but it does have federal funds in it. So there's a rather lengthy process to go through. We're still, we're getting ready to enter into the right of way phase. So there's certification that goes through that. So it, it takes longer to develop those projects. Okay, thank you for that mm -hmm. clarification. Council Member Thomas. Well, working with you and uh, hope to have a little bit more input. Um, I think probably the present, the present plan is not optimum as what we had hoped for in earlier years, but uh, I understand the obstacles and the engineering difficulties of getting through that. And that's one reason why it's taken so long. But it's, of course, a uh, important segment between Fulton High School and then the First Creek Greenway. And then uh, I also want to underline what Council Person Ryder said. Uh, this has been talked about and somewhat in a planning stage for well over 20 years. And I remember talking about it and drawing up some preliminary plans back in the 1990s. So uh, this is a project that we've had to wait for. 
a, a long, long time. And then just in context, uh, the area that this will serve, including the Broadway Shopping Center, is let me say it's just a relatively low income area. You know, this is uh, going to serve some people that um, probably haven't been served very well in the past. And we've had patients, but we're glad to see that, that this finally happening in that area. Uh, and then I also make the point that that section of Broadway, by statistics, is one of the most dangerous areas in the city uh, as far as uh, pedestrian fatalities and accidents. So uh, this is an important thing. It's, it's taken a long time, over 20 years, <laughs> actually. But uh, sometimes we play the long game, and I'm glad to see us getting at least this far along. And um, this doesn't mean that there's not other areas in town that we need to, that have been waiting just as long, and, and hopefully we can get to them soon, too. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Parker? Thank you. Um, I'm curious about um, the uh, Hall of Fame area um, that this is, close to, but I get a lot of questions about plans to make Hall of Fame more pedestrian friendly. Is that uh, within the city's plans currently, or is the green, First Creek Greenway seen as the pedestrian access for that area? So there, there was a study, if you're talking about the the connection of Hall of Fame to Broadway. Uh -huh. there, there was a, a study, but there's no funding identified for that. So, okay. so we did look at, at ways to make that more pedestrian friendly. Okay, thank you. Council Member McKenzie. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanna circle back, uh, speak a little bit about Burlington, and also wanna recognize uh, the fact that we have um, two people, one in particular who has made some major investment contributions in Burlington, uh, which is Terry Kate Hill, uh, as well as Beverly Holland with her uh, daycare. And for those of us who can remember far back, when we think about it, we had Jimmy Who's there, we had the fish market, we had, I think it was, Frazier's had the barbecue drive through place. And, uh, but a lot of that business that was in Burlington historically was white. And if we think about it, we actually have more black businesses now in Burlington with Lemmas, with the Elks, with State Burners, uh, but they are not gonna be sustainable without all of us being intentional about uh, patronizing them, uh, networking with them. Uh, again, we've got so much potential in Burlington, but we wanna make sure that we're keeping those businesses that are there. Uh, and so I'm just gonna challenge everyone to please go through Burlington and when you do, uh, stop by Terry, the social gathering spot. They, they're now open for lunch. Uh, and let's be more intentional. Let's encourage them. Uh, Cynthia Finch now has, she and Kira Wyatt also have service businesses that are there, uh, nonprofits helping in the community as well. But uh, I'm excited for us to get started with Burlington and see that movement and that redevelopment. Uh, but when we think back historically, and a lot of us in the black community, we, we typically, because Burlington is uh, really a black community, but historically it was, it was a white community. And through urban renewal, that is when we saw the great white flight out of Burlington and black people started moving in. Uh, and back then it wasn't popular to live next to black people and in black communities, uh, but we've seen that progression and again, we just wanna make sure that we're intentional about supporting not, not just the streetscape project, but the businesses that are there that are gonna make Burlington and keep it uh, with that cultural richness that we need in this city and in our community. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 11D is a resolution authorizing the mayor to amend the contract with Smith Seckman Reed Incorporated to provide professional engineering design services for the cured in place pipe infrastructure rehabilitation project, increasing the contract amount by $26,250 for a new contract total of $116,280 and extending the date of completion to August 31, 2025. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11E is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute all documents necessary to donate easements and property at 3925 Shod Road to Knox County for construction of the Shod Road project. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 11F is a resolution supplementing resolution number 1644 adopted by the City Council of the City of Knoxville, Tennessee on January 4, 1949, entitled, A Resolution Providing for the in Issuance of Electric System Revenue Bonds so as to provide for the issuance of not to exceed 55 million and no dollars of Electric System Revenue Bonds Series PP zero, uh, 2023. Move to approve. Motion made to approve and second that any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in, oh, council. Council Member McKenzie? Okay. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, we need to do a roll call vote on these bonds, so Mr. Johnson. Vice Mayor Roberto? Aye. Councilwoman Singh? Aye. Councilman Smith? Aye. Councilwoman Testerman? Aye. Councilman Thomas? Aye. Councilwoman Fugit? Aye. Councilwoman McKenzie? Aye. Councilwoman Parker? Aye. Councilwoman Ryder? Nine eyes. Okay, motion carries. Next item, please. 11G is a resolution supplementing resolution number 2075 adopted by the City Council of the City of Knoxville, Tennessee on April 20, 1954, entitled a resolution providing for the issuance of water revenue bonds so as to provide for the issuance of not to exceed $20 million of water system revenue bonds series NN 2023. Move to approve. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, please conduct a roll call vote. Vice Mayor Roberto. Aye. Councilwoman Singh. Aye. Councilman Smith. Aye. Councilwoman Testerman. Aye. Councilman Thomas. Aye. Councilwoman Fugit. Aye. Councilwoman McKenzie. Aye. Councilwoman Parker. Aye. Councilwoman Ryder. Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, motion carries. Next item, please. 11H is a resolution supplementing resolution number R-129-90, adopted by the City Council of the City of Knoxville, Tennessee on May 15, 1990, providing for the issuance of not to exceed 10 million and no dollars of wastewater system revenue bonds, series 2023. Move to approve. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, we will do a roll call vote. Vice Mayor Roberto. Aye. Councilwoman Singh. Councilman Smith? Yes. Councilwoman Testerman? Yes. Councilman Thomas? Aye. Councilwoman Fugit? Aye. Councilwoman McKenzie? Aye. Councilwoman Parker? Councilwoman Ryder? Aye. Nine ayes. Okay, motion carries. Next item, please. 11I is a resolution to waive City of Knoxville taxes on Knox County surplus properties pursuant to Tennessee Code annotated sections. 67-5-2507B5 and 67-5-2508D. Motion made to approve and seconded. Council Member Ryder. Um, yeah, just Ms. Mr. Um, Evans, does the city get a portion of the sales amount that the county gets when they sell the surplus properties? Yes, ma'am. It's the out of the proceeds of the uh, property that is sold, we get whatever our pro rata amount is for taxes. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, on the last uh, tax sale that was done, I think uh, we ended up getting distributed to the city 604 k and some change. And the uh, county got 300 and right around 350 k That was some time back. And it was because that's, that's the way the taxes uh, turned out percentage-wise, we had about two-thirds. The, the county had about one-third on them. Okay. So this may not be a question for you. It might be a question for Mr. DeBose. It might be a question for Mr. Brace. I'm not really sure who's going to answer me here. But properties sold through municipal or governmental tax sales have some title issues. That's the first part of my question before you launch in to my time. So when a property goes through that a lot of times we don't see them redeveloped because it's hard to get loans 
construction monies, et cetera. Are there some other ways that these properties can be put back into play so that they do become productive lots in the city? Because this entire list are city and county, correct? Okay. Correct. Um, the, 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 these are the counties right now. I yeah, mean, but because, they're within the they, city bounds. That is correct. Okay. But they own them. Yes. Okay, so the county owns them. They're That's correct. Deeded. Oh, so they're not... They're not ours. Why but are they the county's property? Because they went up for a delinquent tax sale okay. sometime in the past. Okay. The county was okay. conducting the sale, as they often do, and they proffer the first bid. If no one outbids them, then they own the parcel that they just bid on. And that's what happened with these. So now they and we are wanting to waive the taxes owed so that they can be sold as surplus properties, not delinquent properties, but surplus properties. Uh, and then we can at least recoup some of the taxes, both us and the county. Okay. But the county owns them. So what's the status of their title? So um, David Brace, uh, Chief of Staff for the Mayor, and I'll let uh, my colleague, Mr. Swanson, jump in here. I'll give you the layperson. So oftentimes these properties go, uh, they're very distressed, oftentimes do not have good title. Not every property, but many. And sometimes they're not very buildable properties, so there's a whole mix of them. They go to tax sale. The ones that don't sell def essentially default. The county and the city, when we do these, we put in the first bid. Hopefully someone else will get it. If not, they default to us. Then we go back and try to dispose of them again in another sale. Oftentimes, uh, these properties are distressed and you cannot get title insurance, which does make it difficult to redevelop. So just know that we have multiple other tools. Uh, and I know that Mr. DeBose, uh, and Mr. Rosenberg, and Ms. Ball, and others, we work daily on those other tools. One is the blight acquisition. I think there's a property on your agenda, uh, which is a blight acquisition property where we essentially utilize blight eminent domain uh, and pay the owner a fair market value, but change title, clear title, and then we can dispose of it back into the market and get it redeveloped. We also have KCDC and our redevelopment tools. So again, a redevelopment area where you have distressed properties. Again, these are typically properties that aren't market viable because they can't get title insurance. Uh, and so KCDC is another tool within those redevelopment areas. Um, but the, the tax sale is a tool. There are folks that can go in. Uh, oftentimes they don't need to necessarily have bank financing and they can go in and redevelop, hold uh, and wait for that right of redemption period and then go in and make investments. So it is one tool in the toolbox. Okay. These, these properties will probably be very distressed and we occasionally have conversations with people that uh, perhaps watch the midnight infomercial about becoming wealthy with real estate and then they realize they can't go to the bank and get a loan. And so sometimes they will recycle, but our teams, both the city and the county work together to try to identify properties within specific redevelopment areas or distressed areas. Sometimes they're flood prone properties so we can have our engineering team look at them. So there's a comprehensive look but it's just one tool of many to try to address distressed so and blighted properties. we've reviewed this list with engineering and other departments in the city before we give the, well, these are Knox County owned, Yes. but we've had the discussion that we, we, we don't look, need these for flood mitigation or anything. Our teams work together to try okay. to identify those. Again, this is the county tax sale. They have come forward with okay. these. There are times that we will come forward and we work together with those two tax offices um, but it is an area that Mayor Cannon has asked us to look at. Are there okay. ways for us to do a better job of identifying viable properties? Um, again, out of the total number of parcels in the city, it's a relatively small number, but they're an important small number that we're going to continue to look at ways to uh, get those properties clear title and back into the market. That's the best thing that can happen to somebody get clear title and do something with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ryder. Uh, Councilmember Parker. Thank you, Mayor. How often do we waive the city taxes to be able to move properties from delinquent sale to surplus? Mr. Swanson. Uh, there is a state statute that only allows us to do this when the, when the property is upside down in terms of taxes. So, uh, ah, gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we, would not, we would not have this 
tool as a way to get it back on the tax roll, but for the fact that the property is upside down and can't be sold in a profitable way. And so nobody, nobody wants to deal with it until they can yeah. uh, deal with it in a profitable way. And so the state legislature gave us the, this tool to utilize. We can forgive up to a certain amount of taxes on these pieces of property so that we can get them back on the tax rolls. Mm -hmm. And this is probably a process that doesn't happen as soon as a property is upside down, but something that is checked into every couple of years or something. Yeah. We have to spend some time trying to get them uh, to go in the usual fashion, but when that doesn't uh, gotcha. happen, yep. uh, then we can utilize this tool to get them back on the tax roll. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11J is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement with Floorline South Incorporated to install a floor coating at the light equipment repair shop located at 3409 Vice Mayor Jack Shop Road for an amount not to exceed $69,865. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11K is a resolution authorizing the acquisition by condemnation, if necessary, of a fee, fee simple interest in certain property located at 1209 Forest Avenue, believed to be owned by Timothy C. Gibson at an estimated cost of $151,500 as recommended by the Abandoned, Blighted, and Vacant Properties Committee. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 11L is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute any and all documents necessary to apply for and accept a grant award of up to $2 million with no required local match from the Tennessee Opioid Abatement Council for substance abuse advocacy, prevention, and combating overdose deaths. Second. Motion made to approve and seconded. Uh, we have two people signed up to speak in opposition to this. First is Ms. Every, and then Mr. Roach. Yeah. Um, how much money have we given KPD in this month? In the millions? No, for real. Like, it's been millions. Uh, and it's just ironic that at the same time, we still have issues with KPD that have not been addressed. Ms. Belk is probably the top one right now. Still no justification on what happened to her. Uh, more importantly, the accountability of the people or individuals responsible for the threats that she received via her email. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the concerns we just had with some of the cases. We had Philly Philp and Anthony Thompson Jr.'s case come across the courtrooms. Uh, and of course, as the community, we're absolutely dissatisfied with the outcomes of those. Uh, hopefully, they'll pursue appeal processes that they can through the litigation process with their lawyers. Uh, but the concerns is that the members who were a part of these incidents are still employed with KPD at the exact same time. And then more importantly, again, by data, we know that data shows that crime is driven by poverty, which Knoxville, you have not addressed the poverty issue in the city at all. So I'm just curious at why we continue to fund KPD, but did not fund things that are the root causes of the issues that quote unquote KPD claims they address. And I still cannot uh, overlook the fact that a few weeks ago we watched the hijacking by Andrew over the Heart Initiative, uh, and this looks like another setup kind of filling into that particular initiative of creating the drug court or the mental health court, as y'all want to call it, uh, where you're going to start forcing people into jail or into therapy, which is, of course, not the appropriate process at all to help treat people. We know this from the medical professionals, actually. They speak to this. Uh, and so I'm just continuing to point out, particularly to our taxpayers and those that are in the homeless and housing crisis, especially especially when we have came to this podium numerous times and talked about how we can get innovative concepts and ideals to address these particular concerns, and you all continue to dump money in every word but where we need it to. Uh, and so that's really the main concern here. I know for a fact by my count, if I'm keeping accurate with it, if you want to include the violence interruption and all that all together, we're like around $5 million or so dollars in one month just to KPD. 
And the kicker is that KPD is problematic. There are racism, there is misogyny, there is homophobia, there is transphobia, there is sexism, there is multiple issues in this department, and you all literally keep dumping money into it, like as if it just does not matter at all. But then you want us to continue to trust these people in our neighborhoods. No wonder people are starting to shoot back, like literally. At some point, it breaks its back. Literally, it starts to break the back. And so again, for all the housing folks who are here tonight, just continue to watch how they continue to dump the money, how you continue to bring your concerns, how they continue to ignore you. But the kicker is we have money. And as I've already said on the campaign trail, it's not that we lack dollars. We have poor allotment. We have poor vision. And we have people who only serve the interests of their wants and not the best benefit of the public needs and the public wants. And at that point, I will yield my time. Mr. Roach. Across Knoxville. Um, hmm. Do we have a Metropolitan Drug Commission? Would it not be? I mean, I, the, the problem is the problem. To combat it, you, you know, you need resources. We understand all that. Why the police department, and maybe someone can speak to that, please, and explain to the population to the, of Knoxville why the Metropolitan Drug Commission can't or wasn't a part of this um, request for funds. There's... The, the, I'm simplistic. I'll, I'll say it so you guys can take your shots where you want to. We, we did a thing back a few years ago at the beginning of, of the present mayor's administration. And it was discovered that the city was part of a program. And it had to do with people's health. But somehow, the data from that program, which was a guideline program that came from HHS all the way through the state, to, and you know every municipality in Tennessee had the option to participate. City of Knoxville chose to participate, but most people in the city of Knoxville didn't know that the city was getting ready to participate in that program. But the data from that program was to be kept and administered only by the police department. Why? Why not the health department? Not county health department. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. You know, do a, do your job within the lanes that you've been trained in, and uh, I don't know what the capabilities right now of the police department are, but to administer this type of program. The funding for it is, I'm sorry, it's problematic. It's problematic. So it doesn't make any sense to put another layer, a burden layer on the police department for a program that has to do with people's, literally their mental and physical health status. Okay? And there are probably other nonprofit organizations that could be brought into this process, and you would probably get a lot better results. So, y'all need to ask some questions, and y'all need to ask them right now while you got the chance to do that about what's going on here. Okay? Because if you don't, You're going to get called out, called out loud and clear, especially you, Mayor. Okay, Council Members, that concludes uh, people who signed up to speak to this item. I just wanted to uh, draw to your attention, uh, if you hadn't had a chance to 
read it. Um, um, Fiona McAnally sent an email out uh, to you all just giving you some context about this. Um, we've all heard a lot about uh, the opioid settlement monies, uh, the vast majority of which are going directly to the state. And this grant application uh, that is on your agenda tonight is what KPD is applying for out of that um, entity. None of the None of that money has been distributed yet, and, and this is the first application coming from the city of Knoxville to those state funds. And as, as you have seen in the AIS, um, and um, you know, as, as that email outlined, um, it would, if, if you all approve it, and if this is awarded, it would provide staffing for a victim advocate to work with families that have lost member to overdose uh, or someone who's experiencing substance misuse disorder. Um, it would help expand our co-responder model, uh, would support efforts with drug take-back events, uh, support training on crisis intervention, and support uh, ongoing um, activities to stop drug-related criminal activity, including overdose deaths. As a separate but related matter, uh, the city of Knoxville will uh, get some settlement monies from various sources. It's sort of complicated, a lot of lawsuits, and uh, we've signed on um, to, um, you know, as, as a a party to many different lawsuits. To date, we have received uh, about $350,000 uh, towards that, and we expect to see, receive more over the next maybe 10 to 15 years. We don't know exactly how much, you know, all this stuff is uh, pending. But I have assembled an internal team uh, to help provide recommendations for how the city will use the funds that are, are coming our way. And obviously, uh, that will have uh, members of KPD and KFD on that committee, also along with Charles Swanson and Fiona McAnally. I do want to uh, say that that committee will be keeping in mind the recommendations that came out of the All for Knox process. That was a countywide, uh, community-wide process that the city has participated in uh, consistently. And I, I just want to take a minute to uh, thank the police department and the fire department who are on the front lines of uh, the people who are facing um, drug overdoses all the time. I know uh, we, our, our police officers and firefighters are administering Narcan, saving lives um, all the time, and also trying to direct people to um, treatment and other resources in the community through, through health departments and others. So just wanted to... Um, share that context, and we do plan to bring a recommendation uh, for the monies that we do have aside from this that have come directly to the city to council for your review and approval um, by, before the end of this calendar year. Ms. Parker. Thank you, Mayor, um, and I appreciated receiving the email from Ms. McAnally detailing um, the intention for the use of these funds were it to be awarded. Um, but I was disappointed because we have been having a conversation about uh, various issues here at council and one of those uh, being issues around substance use and um, what services are needed in our community to address these. Uh, issues that 500 overdoses per year, 500 overdoses per year that our city is experiencing, that our first responders are experiencing and responding to. While we have um, uh, ambulatory services that are not arriving on time, which then ties up our fire department's time and they're not able to give the proper care that's needed in the community, People are being lost because of that wait with time. And what I'm hearing from the community when it comes to overdoses is they're afraid to call 911 for help. They're afraid to call 911 for help because they want help to be sent. They want a medical professional. They want someone that can save their family member's life. But they don't want the police to show up. And so we continue to see people die. I mean, you know, we can take a hard line approach to this and say, this is the service you get, deal with it. Or we can respond to a crisis that we're seeing in our community 
and see if we can put a service in place that would save more lives, that would provide that service that our community needs and is asking for. I'm even, I even struggle when I see the phrase substance abuse because I know so many people who have, got, who have been prescribed medication and taken it incorrectly and had very severe uh, health consequences and even there was the potential for death. They weren't trying to be a drug user. They weren't misusing drugs. We have so many um, substances that people are relying on to just keep them alive. And if you take that wrong, that's an overdose that someone has to respond to. And folks don't want to be treated as a criminal when they're fighting for their lives. So it disappoints me that the conversation we've been having the last couple of months about an alternative response team was not captured in this proposal because it's so desperately needed. It's not just about mental health care. It's not just about homelessness. It's about all of these various issues. And we now have money. We have 350,000 we've been told about. We have this $2 million grant that we're applying for. We have the ability as a city to work with our community partners, so we can't, we're not gonna do it on our own. The county, if they, if they stop talking about involuntary locking people up and other partners, to provide new services for our community that, that is desperately needed. When we're experiencing over 500 over death, overdose deaths per year. So I'm not able to support this, this proposal as written but I would just encourage us to not um, work in disjointed ways, but let's pull these conversations together because I think there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of synergy, and I think our proposals will be stronger when it reflects all of these conversations that we're having, when we include these innovative strategies um, that are being lifted up by our community. So that's all I have. Thank you, Council Member Ryder. Yeah, so Ms. McAnally or um, maybe someone in the administration, so the couple of different things. The counties in the state were given disbursements Earlier in the year, according to what I find from the Tennessee Opioid Abatement Council, looks like Knox County was third, got the third most amount. They got over two and a half million dollars. Do we know anything about how Knox County uses or plans to use their two and a half million? Uh, thank you, Council Member Ryder. Uh, Fiona McNally, Director of Government, Government Relations. Ugh, can't say that tonight. Um, Yes, the county is receiving, the county and state are receiving the bulk of the funding from many of these lawsuit settlements. Uh, the county is still working through their process, but they hope to have something out and we're coordinating with them by the end of the year as well. Okay, so they are getting this two and a half million, but they haven't put into play the template of how they're going to use the funding for the community. Correct. It's a pretty okay. broad umbrella. So, okay. you know, everyone wants to make sure these funds are used wisely. Okay. Um, who's at the table? I mean, are we trying to get an additional two million and they have two and a half million and it partners together to be used? Or is that, and who's part of that conversation? Well, it's probably going to be separate processes. The county will have theirs, the city will have theirs, but we are working together and talking about how that process works, making sure we're reaching the largest amount of organizations, but also the money can be used for internal programs as well. Like the county, I, I don't have a clue what they're planning on doing, but they may choose to use some of that money at the health department. Um, you know, th there's lots of options. Okay, so I can talk to my county commissioner and get more info on how they, are talking about using their two and a half million. Yeah, so, but we, we are in conversations with them. Okay, okay. I, I would love to have more details about what sure. they're thinking about or planning because we don't have that piece of the conversation. 
Um, so the information from you is that, and the agenda item is to request through a grant process $2 million. And we're doing that. Um, KPD is, is who put it on the agenda. Mm -hmm. They have a grants writer in-house as part mm -hmm. of the KPD team. And the list of stuff that you gave us is providing, are these the things that are going into the grant application, what you provided us in the email? Yes, I'll yes. defer to KPD to answer more details on that. Deputy okay. Chief Powell is here to answer okay. questions. Deputy Chief Powell, so what I have so far is provide staffing for a victim advocate to work with families that have lost a member to overdose or a loved one who experiences substance abuse disorder. Um, where does that victim advocate work at? So it would be in the overdose um, investigative unit. Currently right now, and it, Referring back to Ms. Parker, you have 511 suspected overdoses in Knoxville County last year. There is numerous amounts of calls coming in for loved families wanting to know what, what the status is on the case of their loved ones to the point that uh, it's overwhelming the department there. So that's what that advocate would be to... So follow up after the overdose. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and then... Support efforts with drug take back events. How do those work? So that is typically uh, works with uh, the Metropolitan Drug Committee and the DEA. Um, we just did one in April. We took back 330 pounds of uh, medicines, unused uh, prescriptions that through like a Kroger. I think the one in April was in Kroger parking lot. So we would like to do more of them. It takes manpower. Uh, to bring the traffic in, to, to get the drugs, and to get people out safely. So it's a, it's a very heavy manpower uh, type of task. Okay. And then one of the other items in, that's going into the grant is support training on crisis intervention. Um, who, who are we training? Who's, who's doing that? So the crisis intervention team, uh, there's training there. There's training all the way across, uh, identifying drug trafficking, Drug traffickers is what we're really uh, wanting to get more of. There was a broad amount of, uh, and these are just the base top hits that we, we listed out. Um, I just want to say I'm very passionate about this. So what we did, we, we sat down with all of the frontline officers that's, that's having to deal with this. And we said, what, what can you need to better outfit you with tools to uh, fight these, these overdoses and these these traffickers and and so we came up with a list uh, and these are the top uh, the biggest thing was the um, the advocate was a huge process uh, the take backs uh, improve our capabilities of, uh, of investigations I mean there is a ton of investigative hours that that is put into each and every one of these so this money would go towards helping with those man hours okay my time's up so Okay, Council Member Singh. Thank you. The Tennessee Opioid um, Abatement Council, I think they have $40 million right now that they're distributing. And the, uh, the date for the grant end is the 16th. So it's something that I know a lot of different agencies, the city's doing one grant, but there are tons and tons of other grants being uh, submitted and some innovative programs. Um, I would love to see it go towards an alternative response, but I also know um, McNabb is working through Department of Justice, I think, on a grant to pay for that. So that has not been forgotten or dropped. Um, yeah, this is an opportunity. If there are some <clears throat> innovation, innovative ideas on how to work on this issue, uh, please apply for this grant. They're, they're letting you be very creative with the solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Thomas. Turn on your mic, please. Thank you. <laughs> For Ms. McNally, um, the, uh, the $2 million that's being applied for and I understand the criteria that was used to get it. Once we receive it, is there any flexibility about how we can use it outside the police department if, if we 
chose to do that. I'm not saying that that would necessarily be the best thing to do, but how much flexibility would there be on how we spent it once we got it? Well, I'm not part of that application. I would assume you have to spend it on what you asked for. Um, but that being said, there is there probably will be additional waves of funding from the State Abatement Council. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Thomas, just, just to add on to that, I mean, the, the police department took the initiative to apply for this grant and, and they are, uh, you know, a big part of what the city of Knoxville's uh, focus is and they're not the only, uh, the only tool or, or way we can do it is not just law enforcement. We all know that and, and this council's been, you know, very uh, passionate about supporting alternative approaches and treating uh, addiction as a, a health issue. I think, uh, as we know, we, as we have learned uh, that we, the monies that we do have, the $2 million we don't have yet. We don't know if we'll get it, or if we get it, we might get less than what we apply for. But we do know that we have a little bit of money coming directly to the city. Uh, the law department and, you know, and, and Ms. McAnally uh, and the other members of our team are studying that they're, they're not unrestricted. You can't just use it just for anything. Like, it can't just be for mental health writ large. Uh, but there are, so we're examining what the rules are for how we can use that and then going to come back to council with a plan. We are also going to be uh, working with, you know, talking to our county partners. They have a health department that serves the city and, um, you know, that health department has a harm reduction division or group of people that works on that. So, so this KPD grant is just one, um, one aspect of strategy. Um, and, and we're just trying to work through what we can and can't do with the funds that we already have. Um, and, and also just want to remind council that we have used uh, community agency grants and, and other contracts uh, to support the many community agencies that are working on this, Positively Living, uh, McNabb, Metro Drug Coalition, um, Next Step Initiative, and, and others. And so those, we want to see if that's one way we can use the money that comes directly to the city that isn't something we have to apply for. Mr. Swanson, you look like you have something to add. No, I would just say that this is a particular pot of money uh, from these class action lawsuits that goes directly to the state. Uh, and the state has created, through legislation, a committee to determine who gets those funds and under what circumstances, and you apply to that committee. The state legislature has appointed the, com the committee that reviews these applications, and that committee will decide who gets what amount of money, uh, if any. Uh, and But when they do that, you will be limited to what you applied for with regard to those particular funds. Uh, that is a different situation than we we are a plaintiff ourselves uh, in a number of these actions, and we are receiving some funds as a result of that. Uh, the $350,000 we've got now, uh, there's more coming, uh, I think, probably before the end of the year, at least another $450,000 or so uh, will come to the city, and we'll have those funds. And those are the particular funds where we have some more flexibility with how we use those funds, and we're looking to... Uh, make connections with our partners uh, who uh, will help us work together to create uh, hopefully some innovative programs for utilizing those funds. But it's still going to have to be for abatement uh, of the opioid crisis and for dealing with future problems related to the opioid crisis. We can't redirect those funds to another purpose. It's got to be related to the opioid crisis, and there is management of that. There is, uh, there is oversight of that uh, from those who, who manage those settlements. And so there's not complete flexibility, but there is some flexibility with regard to doing some innovative programs that will deal with the opioid situation. Okay. Yeah, if I may respond, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, thank you. I was wanting kind of just clarification and nuts and bolts explanation and that was a really good overview and um, I applaud KPD for making this application. Basically I was kind of trying to get an idea of how much flexibility. I hope they get it and of course as the mayor said and you just outlined that doesn't keep the city or other agencies from applying 
as well and um, uh, applying these funds to certain areas that, that can help according to the way that they see fit and some with more flexibility. But thank you. Basically a good nuts and bolts explanation. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Singh. Is, no. Any other? Oh, Council Member Thomas. Okay. Seeing no lights on. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 8-1. The 11M is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute a fourth amendment to contract C-21-0296 with Messer Construction Company to modify the scope of work for the real-time information center at the new public safety complex, increasing the contract price by $24,874 for a total contract price not to exceed $53,000, excuse me, $53,460,574. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Oh, there is one person signed up to speak to this item, Ms. Every. <coughs> yeah, um, again, just continue to raise the concerns about the money that we're spending. Uh, and again, as far as this real-time information center, uh, I feel like this has already been something we have brought to the floor a few times in discussion. Uh, and again, still no real clarification on what exactly is this information center doing, what type of data are they collecting, what is the purpose of the data that's been collected, what will it be used for, how are we actually doing this, is it a form of crime prevention, is it a catalog of potential uh, suspects or predators or assailants, uh, and more importantly, what is the operational purpose of having this information center up and running in Knoxville? Uh, we have yet to have transparency on the necessity of even such an infrastructure. Uh, are we doing it to collect information for ICE and immigration immigrants? Are we using it for the Detroit 311 and the drug trafficking drug line that's been coming through uh, Michigan to Tennessee? Uh, are we using it for something more local right here in Knoxville and trying to reference in to potential gang members or uh, gang affiliations and associates? Uh, I just don't understand why we have all this new surveillance equipment seeming to start to pop up, especially since Paul Noel's been brought into town, uh, and more importantly, the lack of transparency on its uses and purpose. Uh, as I've already highlighted before, we have this uh, security thing online. Uh, that I brought up about the child predators and Paul echoed it. Okay, that's one thing, but do we need point million plus dollars to do surveillance online of child predators? Uh, and then more importantly, again, who is holding this information? Where is this information going to? Are you the council members going to have this? Is it going up to the state legislator and Bill Lee and his people hold this? Or is it going all the way up to the federal office and the president and those chamber members will have the access to the information? Or is it just strictly on a local basis with Knox County Sheriff, KPD, and TBI? Is it just going to David Roush desk as far as it goes? We need to know what you all are doing with this equipment and more importantly, its purpose, objectives, and goals, and who are the potential uh, people of target or interest that you're even using the information for or the surveillance equipment for. Uh, again, I don't see how this has been an impact to crime prevention, particularly in our communities. I don't see it solving murders in our neighborhoods. I don't see it pre pre preventing gun violence or social media bullying online in our community. Uh, I can run through numerous things I don't see it actively doing. I mean, we have multiple uh, issues in our homeless population. We don't talk about the homeless death and the homeless murder and the homeless killing. I haven't seen it do any references in that space and address and those issues and concerns. So I'm just trying to really understand, other than creating some type of potential of cop city level interest in our community, what is the purpose of funding these type of initiatives on taxpayers' dollar? That's the other thing. Why are taxpayers paying for this type of interest? We're not interested in this type of equipment. We told you what our concerns are. We want you to address the poverty. We want you to address the uh, lack of public transportation. We want you to address our housing crisis. We want you to bring in crisis response like heart. We want you to address those concerns. And yet, every time I look up, up, there is a way that you are continuing to filter funding into KPD, who has, again, numerous issues, numerous problems, and numerous concerns. You know what's ironic when we talked, I forgot to bring that up, but I'll bring it up now. 
Uh, we are police officers that have domestic violence issues in their own home. I cannot forget that mother and her children who put herself in a bathroom because her psychotic husband was having an episode in the home. And guess what he worked for? KPD. So well, I can't forget the kid who was stopped at the school, accused of smelling like marijuana and was assaulted, only be found out that only did not have marijuana, but even questioned if it was such a call of smell of odor on him in the first place. And so again, why are we giving this department any kind of funding when we don't have account Ability. It is a rogue department. We have all these unmarked, co unmarked uh, cop cars. Is that what y'all been spending the money on? Because every time I look up, I see a black Chrysler flashing with blue and red lights on it. I'm like, why do we have a Chrysler 300 of the newest grade model, 2023, zooming down our streets with an unmarked car and an undercover cop in it? Explain to me the purpose of that, Knoxville. I can't understand why you all continue, as I said before, fund this department with zero accountability. Your department is rude. You all don't even have control over that. And y'all talking about lawsuits. Well, guess what? I think there's going to be plenty more to come. So maybe you do need the money so you can help cover that cost when it comes down the pipeline. I yield my time. Council member, that concludes people signed up to speak to this item. Uh, Deputy Chief Powell is here to answer any questions you may have. Council member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I have two questions. This is the fourth amendment of, uh, of this agreement. Can, can this, is this expected to be the last? Can somebody provide an update on this? Yeah, I'll jump in really quickly. Yes, yeah, so if you'll remember, the, uh, this was the fourth amendment to the Messer contract. So there was the original public safety project. That's had a few amendments to it. Uh, this was actually a separately funded project. So in the fiscal year 22-23, uh, council approved in the budget 1.522 million for the Real-Time Information Center. Uh, so the contract to actually do the, the nuts and bolts, the sheetrock and the electrical and the uh, infrastructure, that contract was 1,133,500. Uh, and so we extended out above our contingency $24,874. So we've got to do this final change order to wrap up this project and it should be the last one. But it's very specific, again, to this Real-Time Crime Center. Okay. Uh, my second question is on the administrative policy or rules associated with the Real-Time Crime Center. I think the last time we had this conversation, there those weren't developed yet. Have those been developed? Go ahead. No, sir, they have not. We're still working on them. A lot of that will depend or work around the software that, uh, that we would put in the actual Real-Time Information Center. So we're working with, again, uh, I think I stated last time, Oklahoma, New Orleans, uh, New, um, Atlanta, and Charlotte. Uh, but again, they, they're all different software, so a lot of that will drive the software that we purchased. Have we selected the software? No, sir, we haven't. Okay. We'll so, go through an RFP with that. What is the okay. last one? And so the, the, once the software is selected, then the administrative rules will be determined? The administration rules will be determined before it stands up, yes. Okay, sir. all right, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-2. 11, 11 N is a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Wilson Food Service LLC to provide operation and management of Knoxville's Holiday on the Ice skating rink at Market Square for an amount not to exceed $103,000 for the next excuse me, for the first year of services, followed by a 4% increase for the second year if re renewal option is exercised. Move to approve. Motion made to approve and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, there are two people signed up to speak at Public Forum. First is Mr. Zieta. If you come to the podium, state your name and address for the record, you'll have up to five minutes. All right, I am back again over the bottle store. What Ms. Avery said about the police department is partially true, if not entirely true. I know between the police department and the fire department, nobody could imagine burning a store, police department writing a report that the fire department burned it, coroner, and the funeral court and the funeral department or agency or whatever you may call it 
and then a church. And I can prove it, and everybody here knows that knows the story. Uh, well, I forgot the numbers, what they are, of that incident. Well, know that I'm telling it the way it is. But I'm here to discuss the clinic, the abortion clinic. When a person dies, their plot usually takes over a year until the grass grows up. Now, the FBI and the fire department state that Mr. Reno burned the fire department, burned the clinic. I say the suspect is sitting right there. <laughs> Uh, Daryl Whitaker, which I know this is probably Stan, but Daryl Whitaker, the arsonist, the arson investigator, chances are strong. All that anybody has to do over here is pick up the buy low arson pictures of that store fire, and you'll see how I come up to this. Now, we've got a person that's been dead here about a year since February 2022. And that plot, the grass has not grown yet. Now, Mr. Reno, his, uh, yard, his plot is fully engulfed in grass, just like the rest of the people that are over there. Chances are strong, the government, all they did was put the tombstone in that plot. If you doubt what I'm saying, which I don't blame you, it is hard to believe what I'm talking about. Just ask the fire department to release the arson pictures of this clinic, and let's decide if I'm right or wrong. And about uh, Bilo, we all know I'm right. And this time I will leave without arguing or cause a fit. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, but before I go, do we have an agreement to have these pictures released from the arson investigators? Yes or no? I mean, the man's dead. You can't prosecute him, so why withhold the pictures? Let us take a look at them. Am I right or wrong? Am I right or wrong? That's a $2 million project. And not a stone was put up, not a rock, nothing other than a fence around that property. Nothing but a fence. I, said, I requested the pictures from the fire department. They stated they cannot release the pictures. Sooner or later, we will see them. We will see them. Doubt what I'm talking about? Take a look at bylaw. I believe the incident number is 12-048777. Take a look at that store and see the police department, the fire department, and the coroner, and the funeral, and a church, and see what they can accomplish when they get together. Unbelievable. India McDowell was blamed for that fire. Nobody burned it but the city. Well, now, thank you. I know last time I left in a fit. This time we'll, we'll leave a little bit better. And sooner or later, this time next year, I'll be here. I want to see those pictures. I want to see them. Thank you. Thank you. The last person signed up to speak at public forum is Rick Roach. Mr. Roach. Rick Roach, Knoxville. Once again, we're going through city council meetings and a lot of money is flowing, whether it's coming from or being requested. Let's go with that, too. Um, and eventually, when that money hits the city, there's no accountability. And we've got we've to start being a little bit more responsible, dare I say. And uh, David, I want to address something uh, that you said about the, the tax, uh, the, the, the arrangement between the city and the county. 
Okay, everybody knows we got property taxes for the city, we got property taxes for the county. Um, unfortunately, I went through a situation, tax sale, and going through that process, I actually ended up conversing with David about what the possibility was of proceeding. I already had an arrangement made with the county. The county was conducting the sale. I thought I had it all worked out in terms of getting everything paid back and getting it squared away. At least I did with the county. Upon getting to the city office of revenue, I was point blank turned down, point blank. And some snide remark came that, oh, we, we, we doubt that you'd be able to handle this. I said, I've already worked out the numbers. I know what I can do. I know what I can commit to, to repaying. And, and you know, all you have to do, the county's already agreed, OK? Come to find out, these aren't distressed properties that are being sold at tax sales. These aren't distressed properties, OK? Distress may be. Uh, coming from the people, who, the owners, whoever has to go through that process. What's happening is, again, and it's what I speak to a lot, is what does the city have planned for a particular area? What are those plans? Well, those plans are for in this particular situation, an area that is under transformation, demographically speaking. So when you have that going on, and whoever the powers that be, the decision makers, decide, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna change hands. You did it over in South Knoxville. They did it over in South Knoxville. That's how the waterfront situation was done. A lot of people embedded in that area for decades got moved out by hook or crook because plans had been laid, okay? So there were a lot of displaced people, okay? So when the city decides that they want to do something and with their partner, the county, people are put in distress. <laughs> so maybe David was correct that they are distressed properties. We have to start being held responsible. When I say we, not me necessarily, well, okay, maybe. But you, the decision makers, the people who lay out what a city is going to look like, who's going to live where, under what circumstances, okay, you cannot continue to. I mean, I watched, I grew up watching urban removal, literally, from that home property. I watched it. I watched communities wiped out, homeowners wiped out. I watched the balding of Summit Hill Hill, okay? I watched it, you know, where our famed uh, baseball stadium's going. So I know what's, what this city is capable of doing, okay, in terms of manipulating and moving out people, primarily black folk. I understand this, okay? Thank you, Mr. Roach. Council members, that concludes people signed up to speak at public forum. Without objection, this meeting is adjourned. Okay.